Good morning everybody and welcome to the next video in the series on wide sargasso sea and today we're going to look at the kind of central section of part two of the novel and we're going to think about Rochester's cruelty in particular. Make sure you're taking notes as you're watching. Of course, if you know what kind of lens you're going to look at the text through, so whether it's feminist or post-colonial or Marxist, that'll really help you with your note taking because you'll be able to narrow down your focus and just pick out those ideas which are going to be really useful for you. So that should save you some time. OK, so just a quick reminder who the characters are, because this is um, starting to get really quite complicated. We have the, the central family in the story, Mr. Cosway, um, who's died, married Annette, who um, has also died. Um, and their children are Antoinette and Pierre, who has died as well. Now, Mr. Cosway has a son called Daniel Cosway, who features quite strongly in part two of the novel. Um, Annette had married Mr. Mason and um, so Antoinette has a half brother called Richard Mason who doesn't feature in today's video but Rochester obviously does Antoinette's husband and a new character called Sandy Cosway is mentioned quite a few times in part two of the novel. Now he is Mr. Cosway's illegitimate son as well as Daniel um, and so he's Antoinette's half brother. What happens in this part of the novel then? So in the last video, we heard that Antoinette had gone to see Christophine and had asked for a love potion. Well, at the start of today's section, Antoinette returns from her visit to Christophine. She has the love potion for Rochester and Baptiste, one of the servants, tells Rochester where Antoinette has been. So this arises Rochester's suspicions about what his wife is doing because he doesn't trust Christophine at all. Daniel Cosway then writes to Rochester again and Rochester asks Emily about Daniel. Now, in this section, Jean Rees really stresses the ambiguity, the questions about Daniel's parentage. So is Mr. Cosway actually Daniel's father? About his employment, is he a, a religious minister or is he not? About his education, his financial status and his motives. So essentially, Rees asks the question, is Daniel telling the truth? Now, Rochester just accepts all of it without really questioning it at all. But as a reader, we can see that perhaps Daniel is manipulating Rochester because he wants to blackmail him. So Rochester then visits Daniel. Daniel tells him that he's Mr. Cosway's illegitimate son. He was cast off by his father, but Mr. Cosway sent him some money. Daniel then drops some hints about the inappropriateness of Antoinette's relationship with Sandy. Now, Rochester hasn't met Sandy, he doesn't know much about him, but Daniel sows the seeds of doubt in Rochester's mind. He says things like, I see her when she, and then he leaves the rest of it up to Rochester's imagination, which is often a more powerful way of convincing someone than telling them just the direct truth. And we see Iago doing this in Othello, of course. Daniel asks for £500 to keep quiet and Rochester leaves him in disgust. So Rochester returns home and he argues with Antoinette. When he mentions Daniel, Antoinette says there's always the other side of the story and then she proceeds to try to tell it. But Rochester doesn't really seem to be listening very intently and there's lots of misunderstandings between them in this section. Rochester drinks rum. But Antoinette doesn't, and he starts calling her Bertha, so he starts changing her identity. After that, Antoinette uses a love potion. This is her last um, attempt to try and rescue her marriage. It's the only kind of power, the only control that she has left over her situation. Rochester wakes up the next morning. He feels incredibly ill. He doesn't remember what's happened, um, but he does realise that he has been poisoned in some way. And he leaves Antoinette asleep in the bedroom. Emily then brings food to Rochester's dressing room and they have sex. Now, there's only a thin partition between Rochester's dressing room and Antoinette's, so she hears everything. And the whole question in this section is, does Rochester mean for Antoinette to hear this? Or is this just an impulsive action? Does he plan it? And there's been lots of seeds sown earlier in part two about how Amelie keeps looking at Rochester. He thinks Amelie looks very much like Antoinette. He thinks she's very beautiful and so on. So perhaps this isn't quite as unplanned as maybe Rochester makes us think. Rochester then gives Amelie some money and she leaves the estate of Grand Bois. 
Antoinette then leaves and returns some time later with Christophine, who has given her an unspecified sleeping draught, followed by quite a lot of rum. Antoinette has the appearance then of being mad and she bites Rochester. Rochester and Christophine argue, primarily by Antoinette's diary, so Christophine wants Rochester and Antoinette to split up and for Rochester to give some of the money back to Antoinette so that she can marry again. And Christophine also suggests that Rochester has been rough with his wife. She says that there's quite a lot of bruises on Antoinette's body that suggest this. Now, we haven't heard anything about that anywhere else in the text. So again, it's one of those ideas that we have to take with a pinch of salt. Is it the truth? Is it not the truth? Where did those bruises come from? Did they come from Rochester or from someone else? We don't really know the the truth in this situation but the implication is that in some way Rochester is the one who's been violent first before Antoinette bites him. Rochester then asserts his power, his dominance. He tells Christophine to leave or he's going to have her thrown out. Okay and then after this there's only a few more pages of part two left before we get into part three. So Mr Cosway now at the start of this section um, we have these competing narrative voices and Daniel is telling the story of Mr. Cosway, so that's at second hand already, and he's telling this, and then Roger's telling us what Daniel says about Mr. Cosway. So there's loads of layers in this, and of course, as you know from Chinese whispers, as information gets passed down through different voices, it becomes distorted. And that really raises the question of where is the truth in this situation? But I think there are some things that we can hold on to here. So Daniel presents Mr. Cosway as a symbol of patriarchal, of colonial and of class power. And depending what perspective you're going to be looking at this novel through, you could use Mr. Cosway as a symbol of, of one of those ideas. In terms of colonial power, Daniel says that Mr. Cosway um, at, at his funeral, um, on his gravestone and so on, that there's not a word about the people he buy and sell like cattle. And Daniel's disgust for Mr Cosway as a slave owner is really apparent there. And this objectification or animalisation um, of um, black slaves is really apparent there. Mr Cosway also symbolises patriarchal power. So Daniel says um, if he gets sick of a woman, he just uh, give her some money, he get rid of her. Um, exactly what Rochester does with Amelie, interestingly. Um, and he also says that Mr Cosway has told Daniel that your mother was a sly bit. So using quite misogynistic language there. Mr Cosway is also a symbol of class power. So Daniel says he sent me some money, not a word, only the money, as if money is going to solve all of the problems and you can use your money to assert your dominance over other people. And Daniel himself is quite a, a debased character. Um, he seems to drink a lot, he seems to live um, in a very kind of disordered life and so on, very different to what the English coloniser Rochester is used to. And he seems to symbolise the destructive consequences of the inequality, the exploitation, the ideologies of these three social systems. So in a sense, whilst Daniel might appear a little bit... Um, you know, quite quite a lot manipulative in this section of the novel. He's also the victim um, of a society which, like Antoinette, hasn't given him very many options for making a living or for getting what he wants out of life. So Daniel's using his knowledge as power in the only way that he is able to at this point. So he is almost a victim at this section of the novel. Now, the other shift we see in this section of the novel um, is towards a post-lapsarian nightmare. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the word pre-lapsarian refers to the fall from uh, before the fall from perfection in the Garden of Eden. So when Adam and Eve are in Eden and everything's going really swimmingly well um, and they don't know anything about sin, that's the pre-lapsarian stage. And lapse means to fall, pre means before. So it's before the fall from perfection. Now, post-lapsarian is after the fall. So once Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit um, of the tree of knowledge, once they've been cast out of Eden and not allowed to return, this is the post-lapsarian stage. And post obviously means after and lapse again means fall. Now, what has this got to do with Wise to Cast the Sea? Well, there is a small section in part two of the novel 
where Rochester and um, Antoinette seem to be inhabiting a very Edenic, a very perfect state. And there are lots of kind of hints, um, allusions to the Garden of Eden in the Bible. And then after this, uh, Rochester's description of the natural landscape changes and they seem to have entered a post-lapsarian state. They've fallen from perfection. So the pre-lapsarian description, we think we've looked at in a previous video. And Rochester says the fine weather lasted longer. It had lasted all that week and the next and the next and the next. No sign of a break. My fever weakness left me. So did all misgiving. I went very early to the bathing pool and stayed there for hours, unwilling to leave the river, the trees shading it, the flowers that opened at night. They were tightly shut, drooping, sheltering from the sun under the thick leaves. It was a beautiful place, wild, untouched, above all untouched, with an alien, disturbing, secret loveliness. In the late afternoon, when the water was warmer, she bathed with me. And then we have this post-lapsarian description in today's section of part two. And Rochester says that when he goes home, um, so he's inside the house now, the telescope was pushed to one side of the table, making room for, the, for a decanter half full of rum and two glasses on a tarnished silver tray. I listened to the ceaseless night noises outside and watched the procession of small moths and beetles fly to the candle flames, then poured out a drink of rum and swallowed. At once the night noises drew away, became distant, bearable, even pleasant. She, Antoinette, was wearing the white dress I had admired, but it slipped untidily over one shoulder and seemed too large for her. I watched her holding her left wrist with her right hand, an annoying habit. If we were in the classroom, what I'd ask you to do now is to pause and spot the differences between these two um, descriptions. So you could do that now, just pause the video and see how many differences you can find before I go on to explain them. OK, so in this prelapsarian description, we have got fine weather. It seems to go on forever. Um, Rochester feels a lot better. He's got no fever and his misgiving, his doubts about his marriage have disappeared as the weather improves. He's unwilling to leave the river, so he's in this really beautiful, natural Garden of Eden setting and he doesn't want to leave it. So he's forming a real strong connection, a bond with the landscape here, which is quite similar to the very strong bond that Antoinette has with the landscape as well. And this is also an idea that he can shelter from the sun. So whereas previously in part, uh, start of part two, Rochester finds the sun and the weather very oppressive, this setting gives him shelter and it gives him a sense of kind of rest, relief, relaxation. And then, of course, he describes it as being beautiful, as being wild. And whereas in other parts of the novel, wild might be a negative word. Here, Rochester seems to use it as a really positive word. So wild meaning outside of society, uncontrolled, um, a lack of understanding of this context um, from Rochester's perspective. But he's not scared by it this time. He finds it quite enticing, quite interesting. Um, it's untouched and there's that idea of kind of sexual virginity as well, that he's the first person to explore this landscape. And so in a way, it almost merges with Antoinette's body and he enjoys the fact that he is the conqueror um, of this landscape and of Antoinette. And of course, there's colonial um, suggestions there, the idea that colonisers went out to a country and they were the first people to conquer it, to take control of it. Now, comparing this to the post-lapsarian description, then we've got the decanter full of rum on the table. And there's a lot of alcohol in this later section of part two of the novel. Now, what's really interesting is that Rochester seems to drink most of it. And then later on, Antoinette's almost forced to drink the rum. She doesn't want to. And so that kind of undermines this idea that Antoinette was looking for alcohol, that she was drinking far too much, etc, etc. Because actually it's Rochester initially who drinks far too much and who may lose control because of that. Then we have the tarnished silver tray. Tarnished means ruined in some way. If you leave a bit of silver right, um, I don't understand the science, but it oxidises or something and it becomes um, kind of imperfect. So it's like a, a symbol of how imperfect the marriage is. Then we have these ceaseless night noises outside. So whereas in the pre-lapsarian description, Rochester um, 
thought that the natural world was wild, it was untouched, it was alien and disturbing, but he likes that. Now he finds these disturbing night noises quite relentless, quite scary. He doesn't like them at all. And then we've got these moths and beetles, and quite a lot of the moths um, are kind of lying around dead later on in the scene, um, just as evidence, I suppose, of, of an intrusion into Rochester's space, an irritation of the landscape. And then when Antoinette comes in, we've got the dress which slips untidily over one shoulder. So whereas previously for Rochester, that might have been quite sexually attractive. Here he sees her as being, you know, she's not the perfect English um, upper class woman. You know, she doesn't look after herself in quite the right way. She's quite casual about her dress. And he takes this as a sign of her kind of growing madness that she's not prepared to put her clothes on properly. Um, and he's judging her there by the stereotypes of the country that he's come from. And he's making assumptions about her because of how he's been brought up in English society. And of course, Antoinette isn't an English lady, and so it's really quite unfair that Rochester is judging her in that way. Antoinette then gives her account of what happened to her as a child and growing up. Um, unlike the previous narratives, this is filtered again through Rochester's voice. And we've got to ask, is he a reliable narrator? Is this account twisted in any way? Is it changed in any way? And how does Rochester interpret what Antoinette says? Well, he doesn't appear to be listening clearly to what Antoinette's saying. So remember, he's drunk quite a lot of rum and she hasn't. He's got a lot of preconceptions about what she should be saying. And that's changing how he interprets what she actually does say. So he questions her, he doubts her, he considers and he dismisses much of her account. So what does this actually look like in the text? Well, here's a, a, an excerpt from this section. He says, or uh, uh, Antoinette saying through Rochester's voice, Antoinette saying, and then there was that night when they destroyed it, so the estate at Calibri. She lay back in the chair, very pale. I poured some rum out and offered it to her, but she pushed the glass away so roughly that it spilled over her dress. There's nothing left now. They trampled on it. It was a sacred place. It was sacred to the sun. I began to wonder how much of this was true, how much imagined, distorted. Certainly many of the old estate houses were burned. You saw ruins all over the place. And of course, we read part one of the novel. We know what all of this means. We know who the they are. We know that Antoinette thinks this place was sacred because it was the only place where she felt safe. We understand it because we've heard her side of the story. But Rochester is questioning this. If we look at the they, we know from the very opening line of the novel that Antoinette sees society as being divided into different groups who conflict with each other. And this is part of living in a colonial society. The fact that she's very pale tells us how nervous, how anxious, how distressed she is by this account. All Rochester does about that is try and give her some rum. When she talks about trampled, you know, if we, we know that word from Jekyll and Hyde, don't we? The, this little man trampled over the small child in Jekyll and Hyde. But there's a real violence there that maybe is a little bit understated and perhaps Rochester isn't picking up on the implications of what Antoinette's saying. It'd be really interesting if you were going to look at this section to go back and compare it to the description in part one of the novel and look at how it was so vivid and so violent in part one. Whereas here, as Antoinette tries to put into words what she saw, it becomes kind of reduced. So tramples is the only word she can think of to kind of express, to articulate what happened. But actually, it's not quite enough, is it? So that would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, and of course, Rochester gives Antoinette some rum, but she pushed the glass away so roughly that it spilled over her dress. Now, this is a really important detail because Antoinette doesn't want to drink alcohol. The madness of Annette, the madness of Antoinette, is often linked with alcoholism. But here, Antoinette doesn't want the alcohol. Um, and we have this rum as a motif all the way through the text. Um, and it's actually Rochester who's drinking the rum here. So Antoinette's description of what happened can't be attributed in any way to her being drunk. And she doesn't seem to drink very much at this point in the novel at all. Um, and then at the end of this section, um, we have Rochester kind of questioning how much of it was true. Um, and this 
even though he's got this kind of hard evidence, he's seen that so many of the old estate houses were burned. He's got that physical evidence, that ocular proof, as Othello would say, that physical evidence that what Antoinette is saying is probably true. He's even then he's doubting what she says. So it's a really interesting reaction to what Antoinette is saying about her childhood trauma. Her husband, the person who's supposed to love her, questions her immediately. Then later in this section, um, Christophine asserts that Annette wasn't mad. Um, that what happened in Calibri was deeply distressing. Um, Annette was distraught at losing her son and was sent mad because of that. It wasn't because of alcohol. It wasn't because of some kind of madness gene running through the family. Um, it wasn't because um, of her gender or anything like that that it was the events, the traumatic events that happened to her that sent her mad. And Antoinette's account reinforces this idea that she and her mother are actually victims of colonial and patriarchal control. And that it's the colonial and the patriarchal system that result in their madness. So if we look at this section, um, Antoinette says, um, she, she's gone to try and see her mother um, who's been locked up in a house kind of away from the town and Antoinette says I thought I would kill anyone who's hurting my mother. I dismounted and ran quickly onto the veranda where I could look into the room. I remember the dress she was wearing, an evening dress cut very low and she was barefooted. There was a fat black man with a glass of rum in his hand. He said drink it and you will forget. She drank it without stopping. He poured her some more and she took the glass and laughed and threw it over her shoulder. I saw the man lift her up out of the chair and kiss her. I saw his mouth fasten on hers and she went all soft and limp in his arms and she laughed. Or he laughed, sorry. Now there's been a lot of criticism um, of Jean Rhys um, about her representation of black people living on Jamaica. Um, and a lot of the descriptions of them are very unflattering um, and show them as maybe being a little bit villainous or quite villainous in this case. Um, so make sure you take that into account if you're writing about um, the people who are uh, supposed to be looking after Annette but are actually abusing her. But if we look at this, um, there's parallels between Antoinette and her mother all the way through. So when Antoinette is telling this story, she's wearing an evening dress that's kind of sliding off her shoulder. Here, her mother has a dress that's cut very low and she's barefooted. Um, it's interesting to ask why Annette is wearing this. Why has she been put in this dress? Have the people who are supposed to be looking after her chosen this dress? Or is she wearing it to kind of cling on to her memory of when she was a, a beautiful upper class woman? Now the glass of rum again, I said this is a motif running throughout this section of the novel. And it's interesting that the glass of rum is being given to Annette by someone else with this promise that you will forget. And this is what tells us that it's not Annette's alcoholism that has sent her mad. The trauma, the loss of her son, the burning down of her house, um, the abandonment by her husband, the fact that she, her daughter has been taken away from her. This is what leads her to want to drink. She wants to forget all of that. And this man is promising her that she'll be able to forget. And the only way to do that is to drink the alcohol. So actually, a lot of the characters have got the sequence the wrong way round. They say that Annette drinks too much alcohol and therefore she goes mad. Whereas actually it's the trauma that drives her to drink the alcohol. Then of course she throws a second glass away, which is interesting. Maybe she doesn't want to drink as much as they want her to drink. Um, and then at the end of this, we have a, a very traumatising um, description of um, a sexual assault on Annette. And of course, it's only hinted at here that the man kisses her. Um, but the fact that Annette doesn't seem to be surprised by this, the fact that she doesn't struggle against it, indicates that maybe this kind of sexual abuse is continual for her. And of course, this brings us so much sympathy for Annette's distress. And it also goes a huge way to explaining what's happened to her. Now, Rochester doesn't seem to pick up on any of this. He just looks at his wife and sees someone who's getting increasingly more upset and he takes that as evidence of her madness, which she's inherited from her mother. Rochester doesn't listen to the reasons why um, Annette and Antoinette behave in the way that they do. So after all of this, um, Antoinette goes away. She goes to see um, Christophine 
and then she comes back and when Antoinette comes back she's completely different um, and she does seem to have transformed into almost the mad woman in the attic to this violent uncontrollable emotional character that we see in Jane Eyre. And Rochester says, I felt her teeth in my arm. She smashed another bottle against the wall and stood with the broken glass in her hand and murder in her eyes. Now he takes this as evidence of Antoinette's madness. But if we think about it, Antoinette has been traumatised as a child. She's been separated from her mother. She's been married to a man that she doesn't want to marry. All of her money has been taken away from her. Um, her husband doesn't listen to her. He's had an affair with someone in the next room. And now he's treating her badly and he's giving her a different name. So is this attack evidence of Antoinette's madness or is it evidence of a kind of justified anger at what her husband has done to her? And Rochester describes her as a red-eyed, wild-haired stranger who was my wife, shouting obscenities at me. Again, is this madness or is this just that Antoinette is incredibly angry at her husband and at the system and what it has imposed upon her? Is Antoinette a victim here of colonial power, of patriarchal power um, and of the, the kind of limitations of the class system? It's really interesting to look at the fact that Rochester repeats the word wild here. Now, when we were looking at the prelapsarian description, when Rochester was happy and content, that idea of something wild, outside of society, almost out of control, he found enticing. Whereas here, he uses it as um, a derogatory statement. His wife is wild. She's uncontrolled. She's unacceptable. She can't be taken out into polite society. Um, and so Rochester is shifting the goalposts here. You know, he's liked it before. He doesn't like it now. And so we see him increasingly in this section of the novel as being quite a villainous character. So is Rochester responsible for Antoinette's increasing madness? Well, a really important phrase here um, from post-colonial theory is epistemic violence and injustice. And this means taking away someone's culture and rewriting their story. So it's not necessarily physical violence or physical injustice, but it's trying to change someone's identity and trying to tell them that what they think is true is not actually true. So Rochester um, drew the sheet over Antoinette gently as if I covered a dead girl. And that word dead is really interesting. Even though Rochester hasn't necessarily been physically violent towards Antoinette, he has, in a sense, killed her. He's killed her old identity and he's replaced it with this character of Bertha, whose background he's kind of made up from bits and pieces that other people have told him. And he's destroyed everything that Antoinette loves, that she cares for and that she's trying to tell him. So this is an example of epistemic violence in the novel. And of course, in this sense, Rochester is a coloniser. And if we look at his treatment of Amelie, um, it echoes accounts of similar actions in slave narratives and historical records of colonisation. Now, a slave narrative is a autobiography written by a former slave or a, uh, someone who was a slave at the time when they wrote it. And these slave narratives were written to tell the American public what was really happening on the estates where the slaves were living. And in a lot of these accounts, um, especially those by women, there are accounts of the white slave owners um, sexually exploiting the women who are supposed to be in their care or who are working for them. And so when Rochester um, has sex with Amelie, there's lots of echoes of this. And Christophine recognises this. She says, you abused the planters and made up stories about them. So you made up stories about Mr. Cosway. You've said that he's a terrible person, that he's a horrible person and so on, that he slept around. But you do the same thing. You send the girl away quicker with no money or less money. And that's all the difference. So Christophine's accusing Rochester as being as bad as the slave owners who used to own sections of the island. And when Rochester gives Amelie money, this is interspersed with references to the place of massacre. Of course, massacre means that some kind of violence has happened there, probably related to slavery. And this is a haunting reminder of the colonial violence that Rochester is continuing. OK, I've got an independent learning task for you to do here. And using this question, is Rochester responsible for Antoinette's madness? Now, I've listed all of the possible reasons that I can think of 
why Antoinette goes mad or appears to go mad um, at this point of the novel. And what I want you to find is evidence from the text to back up these ideas. Thanks very much for listening. And in the next video, we're going to finish part two of the novel.